Thank you, Lee, uh, for a brief introduction and for going through the housekeeping rules. Uh, so once again, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, just to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Jans Babkevich, uh, and I'm a BOHS certified occupational hygienist working for Syngenta, and I'm also the regional BOHS coordinator for the East Midlands and Yorkshire area. So today we're talking about biological hazards, and let me just say what a great turnout we have for this webinar today. Uh, I can see more than 135 people have joined us today. Uh, and I hope this number will go up as we continue. So biological hazards, undoubtedly, it's a fundamental part of occupational hygiene practice. We all know that workplace hazards can be chemical, physical, and of course, biological. Uh, however, health and safety professionals and occupational hygienists often shy away from them. Uh, biological hazards are often thought of as something special and standalone discipline that maybe healthcare professionals or infection control specialists would deal with. However, with the beginning of the COVID pandemic, many workplaces suddenly realized that occupational hygienists possess a perfect skill set to control exposure to biological hazards, which of course SARS CoV 2 is. In my opinion, no other professional has a better skill set to address exposures to biological hazards than occupational hygienists. In fact, occupational hygienists and other health and safety professionals dealt with exposure to biological hazards well before the pandemic. In the UK, exposure to biological hazards is governed by the Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations 2002. All those bits of regulations related to risk assessment, control, training, and monitoring equally apply to both chemical and biological hazards. The most, the, the, the most well recognized biohazards uh, in occupational hygiene circles are Legionella and SARS-CoV-2. However, the UK HSC publishes the approved list of biological agents with hundreds of other biological agents to which COSH regulations apply. So long story short, biological hazards are nothing new to the practice of occupational hygiene, and we should not shy away from it. And to help us to do that, we have a subject matter expert with us, Professor Gustavo Hezenji de Souza. Gustavo is a professor and a specialist in occupational hygiene at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's a certified occupational hygienist by the Brazilian Association of Occupational Hygienists. And in addition to his academic practice, he's a technical director at GV Occupational Health and Safety. Gustavo also runs several successful social media accounts focusing on the promotion of occupational hygiene. So please go check out his channels and you'll find some really good stuff there. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Gustavo. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Jens, for your introduction. And uh, guys, I'm so glad and uh, it's an honor to take part in this event and uh, to talk to a qualified audience present here. And uh, by the way, uh, I'd like uh, to thank Jens uh, for the invitation and uh, congratulate him for, yeah, uh, you, uh, for the excellent occupational hygiene content uh, shared on social media uh, platforms. And uh, well, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, presence uh, uh, of my friends from, from Brazil especially I, I i i saw some friends here but i'd like to thank especially my great friend uh occupational hygienist uh marcus braga <laughs> thank you man so much uh to be here and uh well let me introduce a little bit about myself uh, my name is gustavo Rezende, and uh, i am an occupational hygienist uh, certified by the occupational hygiene brazilian association and uh, I also have a degree in science and uh, technology from ABC Federal University. 
and uh, I'm a specialist in occupational hygiene from Sao Paulo University, and uh, I'm a safety work technician from Senac Santo André uh, as well. And uh, well, my experience is in different uh, areas of occupational hygiene, from sample collection uh, in the field to statistical uh, date treatment. Uh, but uh, well, I I've been working as a consultant in occupational hygiene in the healthcare system for a long time. Uh, more specifically, uh, at hospitals, uh, clinics, <laughs> including uh, death uh, insurance service, <laughs> and uh, other places uh, dedicated to human health care or relative service. And uh, during this time, I've, I've been working so closely with biological hazards, more especially in hazard identification and uh, occupational uh, risk assessment. So, yeah, this topic is quite interesting for me. Uh, so, uh, and the, the theme of this webinar is uh, biological hazards, uh, identification, evaluation, and uh, control. Uh, a very pertinent uh, subject in view of the recent period we are experiencing in relation to uh, COVID-19. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, in, on the next slide, uh, I think it's not new to, to anyone, uh, but for, for decades, uh, there, 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 uh, there has been a symbol, uh, used universally to represent biological hazards in, in different situations, but especially in hospitals and health service in, in general or where there's the presence uh, of contaminated material. And uh, well, it was created in 1966 by Charles Baldwin, an environment health engineering uh, engineer for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for uh, the famous CDC from United States. So it's a popular symbol used to to represent biological hazards in different places, in different situations. And uh, well, uh, but uh, here in Brazil, uh, like in another in other parts of the world, uh, there are some standards to talk about uh, before uh, we go deeper into the subject. For example, in labor uh, legislation uh, here in Brazil, we can find a definition about what are considered uh, risks in terms of occupational hygiene. And uh, among them, we have biological hazards. So uh, bacteria, uh, fungi, bacilli, uh, parasites, protozoals, viruses, among others, are considered biological hazards in the workplace and are an object of identification, analysis, and the control by occupational uh, hygienists. Uh, however, guys, uh, in another standard in Brazilian labor uh, legislation as well, uh, specific to healthcare facilities code NR32, we can find a broader definition for biological hazards, including uh, genetically modified uh, microorganisms, uh, toxins, and uh, prions, uh, I mean, which are basically bacterial proteins. Uh, and, uh, well, in my perception, in this moment, uh, I mean, in the post-pandemic or, or, or almost post-pandemic time, depending on where you live, I think the last two years have been quite important for occupational hygiene professionals to look at exposures to biological risks with more uh, interest. Because uh, when compared to physical and chemical risks, I have the perception that we don't give the same importance as we do to other risks at least here in Brazil, I mean. And uh, unfortunately, uh, today, our discussion here about biohazards, in, uh, I, I mean, in Brazil as well, uh, are very much focused on financial compensation for exposure instead of talking about aspects 
of prevention of diseases caused by exposure to biological hazards and uh, biosafe factors. And uh, well, uh, it's worth pointing out that the human being has a viral and a natural microbiota consistent of different types of microorganisms that live with us in a peaceful way, regulate different uh, functions of, of our body, and uh, you know, even uh, protecting us, especially the gastrointestinal tissue, the skin, the respiratory mucosa, the oral flora, among other parts of the body. And uh, it's necessary to remember that only a small part of the microorganisms that cause disease to humans, uh, that is, some ones have a pathogenic potential. And uh, they are microorganisms that we are interested in evaluating and uh, controlling in occupational uh, hygiene. Uh, so, uh, guys, I want to make some considerations about biohazard assessment. Uh, I mean, uh, mainly considering some approaches for an investig investigative analysis to identify and access biohazards in the work environment. And uh, here uh, in Brazil, uh, talking about the regulated norm, uh, norm number 32 again, uh, it establishes that biological risk is considered as the probability of exposure to microorganisms. Uh, and uh, here, uh, please, uh, just to understand, uh, sometimes I'm going to say uh, biological agents, uh, but it is biological hazards because here in Brazil we use uh, this expression biological agents a lot instead of uh, hazard, uh, biological hazards. So just to keep the same understanding here, guys. Uh, so uh, I wanna I wanna consider some points to analyze here. You know uh, some uh, valid approaches for any type of biological risk assessment. So first of all, uh, we have make an analysis of a possible uh, communicable disease from epidemiological data. And uh, well, uh, it's important when we think about some health sectors, uh, particularly huge hospitals, uh, where there's infection uh, committees responsible for checking hospital acquired infections. And uh, well, we know how health professionals are more prone to occupational exposure. So uh, through this approach, it's possible to correlate some infections with some kinds of biological hazards to determine activities where health professionals are more prone to occupational exposure. OK, uh, second one, analyze very carefully the source of danger present in the workplace. Uh, I mean, here we can list a few sources, uh, for instance, different kind of objects, materials, surface, uh, perforating materials, sick people, and uh, even to a lesser uh, extent, uh, contaminated food as well. Uh, the next one is observe the situations where uh, contact may occur between the source of exposure and the workers. Well, uh, there are different ways to be exposed to biological hazards. The most common way is through the air, for sure, when droplets are uh, dispersed uh, through the air, serving as a means of locomotion for different microorganisms, especially for the, uh, those uh, living in the, in the oral flora. And uh, well, in close environments, when air circulation is low, droplets are more able to circulate and hang in the air for a long time. Mm, so let me give you some example. Uh, based on Stokes' law and the Koenigan correction factor, an aerosol of uh, of this size, you know, uh, pretty pretty small. Uh, would take an average of five hours and ten minutes to precip uh, to precipitate 
20 centimeters. Oh, it's a quite long time. So probability to inhale the same particles is pretty high. And uh, uh, some researchers, uh, as Darleman et al. Uh, point out, the viral particles remain active in significant quantities in the environment for three hours after their emission. And uh, as well, it's a long time uh, to be exposed to this kind of aerosols in the workplace. And uh, besides that, uh, there are a, der a dermal risk uh, particularly related to dermal contact between people or contact with some kind of vector as insects, uh, rodents, among other potential infect, uh, infected uh, animals. And uh, well, the last one is analyze preventive measures, often called barriers, uh, already implemented by the company. Uh, so, guys, a, a huge problem in any kind of risk assessment, in my point of view, is uh, uh, we, we disconsidered uh, this kind of protection. And uh, as I said, no matter which risk we are dealing with, uh, but uh, we, we, we often disconsider the effectiveness of the control measures already implemented in the workplace. And uh, there are different ways to consider this through negative pressure, uh, pressure uh, ventilation with high efficiency air purification filters, normally called, you know, uh, high efficiency particulate air. Uh, and uh, it's a great example, but not only this, we can consider uh, training, safe signaling, Safe, uh, safety uh, procedures and the use of personal protective equipment, PPE as well. OK, uh, well, so uh, besides that, uh, we have to consider three uh, different uh, variables about biological hazards. Uh, so they are uh, first of all is pathogenicity. The, uh, I mean, uh, the potential to, to cause uh, a pathology, a uh, disease, uh, violence, uh, the intensity of damage uh, caused. And uh, well, here, I want to I wanna consider some things. Uh, uh, let me take an example. Uh, influenza virus and uh, uh, Ebola virus, both are pathogenics. However, uh, virulence is completely different between each other. So we can't put all microorganisms in the same level of damage. Yeah, we have to decide it, it looking for biological risk classification used in different countries. And we are going to, to discuss it uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and uh, it's important to classify uh, in different levels uh, of risk. It's pretty important. And uh, well, the last one is propagation for the collectivity. How the microorganism is spread in the environment, for instance, through droplets, aerosols, blood, or other blood fluid. Yeah. And uh, as I said, guys, the most effective way to, I think there is a mic open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, no problem, it, it, it's happening. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, and uh, as I said, the most effective way to spread it is through the air. Then the contamination of many people becomes very easy. Yeah, so we have to consider all the possibilities, okay? Uh, so here, in, in summary, we can highlight the following aspects. Path transmissions, persistence of the microorganism in, in, ex in external environments, uh, I mean, outside the host's uh, body, and the estimation of severity based on the variables, uh, variables uh, describe it, pathogenicity, violence, and the propagation uh, for the collectivity, yes. Uh, all of these aspects uh, are pretty important to consider in a biological risk assessment. 
And uh, well, now I'm sharing the summary of biological risk classification used in Brazil. We have the same variables mentioned uh, to classify biohazards. The only difference here is the addition made in the last column, where we consider the existence of prophylax or effective treatment possible, meaning the existence of vaccines that can prevent the disease or even the uh, existence of medicines, uh, procedures that make possible the treatment and the clinical follow-up of uh, the disease. Uh, in, in a nutshell, the, the, uh, we, we can say in a nutshell, the higher the value of the first column, the greater the danger posed by a type of microorganism. Yeah, that is the way that we use to classify biological hazards here in Brazil. It's not it's not hard. It's a simple uh, tool to, to use. And uh, on the next uh, slide, uh, this is an example of biohazard classification, where we can see the name of each microorganism and uh, the classification of each one. In the third column, uh, there is a space to add some specific note about some of them, especially there some vaccination is available or whether the microorganism is allergic, oncogenic or produce a toxin while inside the host organism. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, looking at this chart, uh, it looks like they are all classified as two. So let me show <laughs> you another example where we have different classifications. Uh, so uh, on the next slide, we can see other classification values including a uh, phylogedry family where there are Ebola virus and Marburg virus. And uh, this last one uh, is interesting uh, because uh, this last one is one of the most little viruses ever identified in human uh, history. And uh, it, it causes a very serious internal hemorrhagic fever and uh, it's responsible for a high level of, uh, of fatalities. So it's interesting to know more about any kind of uh, bio uh, biological agents uh, looking for some specific specifications uh, about, uh, about, uh, about uh, it and uh, try to search uh, more information uh, about uh, each one. And uh, well, but now I, I'd like to share uh, other standards with, with you guys, because here in Brazil, we have some uh, reference to use and uh, some uh, literature uh, available to, to check. Uh, but I want to share some standards, reference and other source of information uh, regarding biohazard uh, uh, identification and uh, analysis. And uh, the first of these is the technical note on prevention uh, 833 from the Spanish National Institute for Occupational Safety and uh, Hygiene. Uh, this is called Biological Hazards uh, Simplified Assessment. Uh, and uh, in general, the Spanish uh, norms are an excellent uh, reference, not, not, not only in Brazil, but in, almo in almost all South American uh, countries. Uh, I don't know that, that there is someone from uh, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, but I know uh, uh, a lot of people that have been using this reference so much. And uh, well, uh, basically, we have the same classification parameters already mentioned according to the Brazilian uh, legislation. The risk groups uh, are divided into four classifications, and uh, the higher the value, the greater the capacity to cause uh, disease and uh, the transmissibility of a microorganism besides the fact uh, that no effective treatment and the prophylax measures are known, okay? 
and uh, well, also uh, uh, after the final biohazard classification, yeah, there's a brief uh, flow chart. Uh, and uh, by the way, oh, sorry guys, this is Spanish uh, as well. I didn't translate it. Okay, sorry. Uh, but going back to the uh, flow chart, uh, there are some recommendations here, especially from the classification of, of group two. Uh, and the, on, the, on the other hand, in group one, we basically have the application of simple safety and uh, occupational hygiene protocols. Okay, we have to take care of group two, uh, group uh, three, and especially group four. That they, they, they are uh, they are more pathogenic and uh, they have more virulence compared than the other groups. Okay, uh, but but it's important to note how there's a correlation between the classifications and the other current standards. This is something very important because it demonstrates a chain of factors that favor the management of biological hazards in different states. Uh, another very interesting uh, research source is the, uh, here in Brazil we say uh, gestis. Uh, I don't know how uh, you pronounce in your uh, mother language, but uh, I don't know. It can be uh, guests or jests. I don't know. But uh, oh, in, in Germany, we have this uh, this web page, uh, and uh, it's another very interesting research source uh, about uh, biohazard uh, database. And uh, in the in the gas uh, on the gas website, uh, uh, it, it's very uh, well known and use it to research the occupation exposure limit of different chemicals around the world. But what not everyone knows is that there's a page to check a database with information about different types of microorganisms and uh, exemplary activity uh, uh, sheets where it's possible to identify the most likely microorganisms depending on the type of task uh, being performed. And uh, well, on, on this slide, we can see a database that can be checked. Uh, let's look at a, a simple uh, consultation uh, example here. Uh, so click, uh, clicking on the list from A to Z, we'll open the page with uh, data uh, on each microorganism uh, and uh, also uh, on the different types of activities. So we have a list to, uh, to, to, to choose here, yeah? And uh, well, by selecting the letter M, we will open another page with the name of different microorganisms. And uh, uh, with this same uh, initial letter, okay? And uh, among them, guys, uh, we will select mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis as an example. And uh, well, on the next uh, slide, uh we we have uh we have uh, some part of the information contained uh in the mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis fact sheet but there's other da data such as transmission uh, roads medical um, medical significance uh what else uh sectors and the activities where that are uh, maybe more exposure, uh, the preventive measures that can be applied. Uh, and uh, well, th there is an image to show a bacterial colonization of this type of, of pathogen. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's a great tool to use to know uh, more or to get more information 
about uh, some type of microorganisms. Here in Brazil, we don't have this kind of information. Okay, we have some some, some things here, but not in a deeper in a deeper level uh, as we can see here. Okay, and uh, well, uh, besides that, uh, on the other page of guests. A website, we can see another option to check that now refers to a set of activity sheets and uh, their potential exposures to biological hazards. And uh, well, let's look at an example I selected. Uh, and uh, it is an activity of disposal uh, industry. Uh, waste collection, little uh, little service. Uh, you know, it's pretty common in different countries. So it's a great example uh, to use here to show uh, how we can use this kind of formation from guests. Okay. Uh, well, so uh, we can see an example photo of this type of activity. Uh, next. Uh, there's a list of the potential biological hazards existing in the materials uh, handled by the works in this sector. And, uh, you know, we have different types of bacteria, fungi, and uh, viruses as an example. And uh, it's worth remember what I said a few minutes ago. Regardless of the source of information, we are dealing here with the most likely microorganisms according to the type of activity, okay? In fact, guys, we have a presumption of occupational exposure. We aren't certain about what we have there. You know, it's not easy to identify biological hazards. Uh, so yeah, here we have a source of information to use to identify uh, the most probable, uh, uh, probable uh, microorganisms in, in different type of activities, okay? And, uh, well, uh, in North America, another source uh, is the Canadian government uh, patho uh, pathogen uh, safety uh, that, uh, data uh, sheets, uh, particularly uh, for lab uh, labs, uh, labs work, which uh, contain biosafe information for uh, for different types of, of procedures. Uh, and it's good if you work at some, you know, university, some lab, like here in ABC Federal University, we have different uh, bio labs. And uh, if you have this kind of, of sector to analyze, I recommend this site so much to consult information about biohaz uh, biohazards in, in labs because we have uh, great examples and uh, information available uh, to use free. So that's pretty good as well. Let me uh, drink uh, some water, please, because it's not easy to talk, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, one second. Okay, let's go. Okay, but we have to use this information. Okay, we have to take some action uh, from that. So uh, all uh, the information uh, uh, cited uh, here is used by me and my team when we prepare a biological risk assessment for the development of the risk management program, uh, which is currently uh, here in Brazil, the, the most uh, comprehensive uh, program for the prevention of accidents and uh, occupational disease existing in the Brazilian legislation. So guys, uh, we, we seek to specifically identify each type of microorganisms and uh, its uh, respect risk category in order to prioritize control measures in relation to the most aggressive microorganisms present, uh, present in the workplace. So I use all uh, 
uh, this information uh, to prepare my my risk my, my biological risk assessment, but I use it to to manage uh, the exposures in the workplace. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty good to have a lot of information available to consult. But what we we are going to do with this information, we have to take some action by then. It's pretty important. It doesn't matter. It uh, doesn't matter if you have the, this information if you don't do nothing. And uh, it is, uh, and uh, we we had this possibility uh, working as occupational hygienists uh, professionals because we have to work not only chemical hazards or noise or or heat or vibration we have to use this information to management exposure to biological hazards it's pretty important guys and uh well uh by the way <laughs> i'd also like to share uh some experience that we we developed me at federal abc university where i got my my, my degree I have had the opportunity to work on some research project with my colleagues, uh, Diego Marin and uh, my friend uh, Reinaldo Morelli, uh, to monitor the occupational exposure of some works, uh, workers uh, to biological hazards. And uh, uh, we are using a, a, a sampling a pump typically used uh, to quantify chemical agents. Uh, and uh, it, it's operating in a flow rate of four uh, liters uh, per minute uh, with a bottom type particle separator with a collection efficiency curve of 100 uh, micrometers uh, for the inhalable uh, fraction according to ISO 7708. And uh, well, uh, as you can see in this uh, photo, in this picture, uh, monitoring uh, is is being done in, in different environments. Uh, I mean, especially in some labs on the university uh, campus. And uh, it is an individual monitoring and not at a fixed uh, point. Uh, well, unfortunately, here in Brazil, there's still no specific method for this type of sampling. But we are analyzing uh, which is the behavior of occupation exposures, depending on the type of activity uh, and the other factors. Uh, however, I need to point out that there's no established occupational exposure limit for biological agents or biological hazards because there's no homogeneous dose response relationship defined as there are for other types of risks. Okay. And uh, well, on this slide, we can see some uh, characteristics of the parameters used, such as the flow, the standard in accordance with ISO 7708 for inhalable fraction, uh, the load interference by the direction and the speed of the wind, and uh, as well as the reduction of the effects uh, caused by the accumulation of static electricity. So guys, it has been a great way to determine the exposure to biological hazards uh, using an individual monitoring. As I said, there is no method available here in Brazil to do that, but it's, uh, it's an approach or a way to get more uh, accuracy or more uh, good, good uh, data to take some action or to do something in relation to provide uh, personal protective equipment, uh, safety uh, protocols and uh, other measures. OK. And uh, well, <laughs> guys, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity again. 
uh, as I said, it was an honor uh, honor to be here sharing some of the experience that we have been developing in Brazil, among other information related to biological hazards. Uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, congr congratulations to everyone uh, at uh, a boss here in Brazil. We usually say boss. OK, uh, I don't know. Uh, is it correctly? But uh, for the excellent webinars, organize it. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you uh, to Jan and Jens for the invitation. And uh, I also leave my email contacts and my social networks where I often post about occupational hygiene. And uh, if I can, I would uh, I, I, I I'd also like to leave a message in, in Portuguese for my friends from Brazil uh, or for those who watch it, uh, this video later. Uh, muito obrigado por prestigiarem o evento e sigam trabalhando pelo desenvolvimento de uma higiene ocupacional de, de, de excelência, meus amigos. Uh, what I said was thank you uh, very much for attending the uh, event and uh, continue working towards the, the development of uh, excellent occupational hygiene uh, around the world. And now I make myself available to everyone for any comments. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you very much, Gustavo, uh, for this insightful presentation on biological hazards. Uh, it was great to hear about the variety of resources available out there to assist occupational hygienists in exposure assessment. I hope your presentation helped our viewers to, to realize that uh, fundamental principles of occupational hygiene apply in the same manner to biological hazards as to any other form of environmental agents. We have plenty of resources available to recognize the biological hazard. We have methods for quantitative assessments of biological agents and um, mm -hmm. You showed us that we have ready to use solutions for controlling exposure. And um, you also touched on various international standards and biohazard classification schemes. Um, although somewhat similar, uh, this will vary from country to country. So it is yeah. important to check with your local health and safety authority for the most exactly. up-to-date guidance. Um, so for those practicing in the UK, you should refer to the biohazard containment levels two, three and four outlined in the COSH regulations and to the approved list of biological agents published by the UK HSC. Um, but to conclude, I think with, with, with some additional investment into researching this topic of biohazards, I believe many of us already possess the right skill set to undertake this type of assessment. And uh, this presentation certainly gives us the confidence to explore this area of occupational hygiene. So thank you very much, Gustavo. Thank you, thank you. And uh, it was so important to remember that you have to consult uh, the standards of your uh, our uh, your country uh, to check it's possible to use this kind of information because here in Brazil, in our legislation, it, it, it's possible in some situations, but for sure, you have to consult uh, your regulation, your uh, standards to be in compliance with the with the law. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Uh, so we have some time um, to answer questions, and we have a lot of them coming through, and uh, even more after we finish. So I'll do my best to uh, to ask them all. It might take a bit longer than. We have allocated time, but we'll try to answer as many as possible. So if you don't have a chance to stay um, for the entirety of Q&A, please uh, watch us later on uh, YouTube uh, to see all answers to, to Q&A. And uh, I'd like to take opportunity. Sorry, uh, I'd like to take opportunity to ask the first question, uh, Gustavo. Um, but you already answered it, but I was hoping to ask if there's any exposure standards, you know, for biological hazards, because as hygienists, you always want to have some sort of benchmark to compare against, you know, you got your numbers, you got your data. So now what? Let's compare it to something. Uh, so I was I was quite disappointed that there is nothing yet, um, but maybe you can tell us a bit more if there's something something coming in the pipeline? Is there any projects to implement any standards? 
Yeah. Well, uh, we we have been uh, consulting uh, consulting uh, some some information to to analyze if there is um, a standard or some kind of method available or official available to to use. You know, because I mean, uh, yes, for uh, for uh, for measure. Uh, uh, chemical hazards uh, in the workplace. We often use uh, NIOSH's method, OSHA's method, ASTM method. So yeah, we have a lot of them to use. And uh, in Europe and uh, in Asia, uh, we found some information uh, about new protocols, new methods to, to use. Uh, but for sure, we don't have a dose response in terms of exposure to biological hazards. And uh, okay, we have some infectious dose in in, in the in the literature, uh, but but it's not uh, an uh, occupational occupation exposure level to to use. And uh, well. I think maybe uh, this uh, this pandemic time uh, has uh, has been a great opportunity to to think more about this about this kind uh, of uh, possibility. Uh, not as I said, not to <laughs> develop uh, an occupation exposure limit for for them. But just to think about new ways to to analyze biological hazards in the workplace, because in, uh, most of time, uh, the most of time we used uh, qual qualitative approaches, and uh, okay, there there is no problem uh, to use uh, uh, these kind of 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 tools. However, I think we can go for uh, we can go to a next level. You know, we can we can do more, and uh, I think uh, this research is one of the ways to provide new uh, uh, methods and uh, new uh, parameters to 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 use by occupational uh, hygiene professionals. Uh, it's not easy. Yes, uh, it's not easy because we have to develop uh, new uh, studies in different uh, work environments, and we had we had a lot of limitations to go to different co uh, companies to 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 develop new uh, new search, uh, re research there. Sorry, uh, but I, I I'm. Uh, optimistic you know in terms of what uh, we 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 have doing and uh, as soon as possible uh, we we are going to have new new approach uh, to use and uh, some good things uh, are coming in terms of uh, biological risk assessment thank you Gustavo um, just to confirm housekeeping rules, if we can all keep uh, mics off and if you have any questions, just uh, drop them in the chat box and I will read it out to Gustavo so we make sure your question is addressed. So I'll try to address those questions that were submitted uh, during the presentation. And the first question was from, from Kevin who asked, uh, what respiratory protective equipment do you specify for healthcare workers treating confirmed and suspected COVID COVID nineteen patients and mm -hmm. patients in other parts of the hospital. I got it. I got it. At least uh, here in Brazil, we use uh, PFF two. It's equivalent to N nine five in US. Okay, so we have to to use uh, some uh, facial uh, respirators. Uh, and uh, it it uses uh, filters to block microorganisms, uh, regardless of the type. So it can be a bacteria, uh, a viruses, but we can uh, we we don't uh, we we can't use 
uh, popular masks, you know, like that kind of masks that we have been using uh, on the streets, you know, no, we have to use uh, PPE. So N95 is uh, the minimum or at least that you have to, to use at hospitals, clinics or, you know, every place when we when uh, where we have to provide this kind of protective for the workers. Excellent. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, next question from William, and the question is what type of sampling such as sampling methods, equipment selection would you recommend for typical office, healthcare building, manufacturing facilities and more? Uh, in my in my experience, everyone measures and samples differently. So the question yes. about sampling <laughs> methods, yeah. Yes, it's a it's a great it's a great issue. Uh, well, uh, to to measure uh, biological hazards, we have to to use uh, some equipment to measure it in a fixed point. It's possible here in Brazil as well. We use an equipment, and uh, it is uh, and it's used in a specific point to to collect microorganisms there. Or we can use this new approach. Okay, uh, through this method, uh, regardless of where people are working. We can use uh, a simple, uh, a simple, simple. Uh, it is a, a gelatin uh, membrane. Yes, we put it inside the bottom. Yeah, and uh, we connect it uh, in the pump, and uh, we select uh, the flow rate of four liters per minute. But we don't uh, collect it for a long time. Because, for example, uh, NIOSH, uh, NIOSH manual uh, uh, re re uh, recommends oh, you have to collect uh, 17 or 75 percent of the total uh, of the time time work, you know. But for biological hazards, uh, we have a sensitive membrane there, so we have to collect uh, each sample using just 30 minutes yes uh each 30 minutes we have to substitute the membrane so it is a limitation of the method uh, of this new approach uh, but as i said regardless of the the source or the work environment you you can you can use uh, the same kind of equipment yes uh, it's not chance and uh, well and uh, about uh, about uh, all the websites that I I brought here or uh, I gave here yeah uh, all of them uh, are applied in different kind of of activities so we can use it in in different jobs in different tasks so well uh, we don't have any kind of limitation in terms of application, okay? Thank you, Gustavo. And I think building uh, up on this um, answer to this question, we have a, a question from uh, Johnny who asks if there is an occupational hygiene method to sample and evaluate the COVID-19 virus at the workplace. Uh... No, uh, I I don't know. Uh, we we have we have a search, you know. Uh, 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 we have some research uh, uh, about that. You know, you can find different methods available to use, but not uh, something that we can check or or find uh, in uh, on NIOSH uh, web page, for example, uh, to to use uh, officially. Yeah. Uh, but this method that I mentioned, uh, it's uh, capable to to get uh, a SARS-CoV-2 as well. But the 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 method used uh, in the microbiology lab is different to analyze bacteria, 
and the uh, virus uh, because uh, the extraction of this kind of microorganisms is different uh, is, is different uh, each other so yeah we are able to use for SARS-CoV-2 uh, but uh, we have to take care of some factors as uh, the level of uh, hu uh, humidity in the, in the air, the speed of the air. So there are different situations that can that 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 uh, make it difficult, you know, uh, to collect especially SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but in Brazil and in South America in general, uh, I don't know uh, a specific method to analyze SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we have been using this an official method to, to collect uh, this biological agent as well. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, we, had, we have a few more minutes left to answer <laughs> questions. And uh, to give you a slight break from talking, I have a few questions here that I think uh, I'll be able to answer myself. Uh, I have one question from Fiana, and she's asking, uh, is there something similar database for Ireland and UK? And I think uh, she refers to the justice database, uh, the German da the justice database. And uh, we, we can say that we do have something similar. So UK HFC has a web page called Biosafety Resources, and they provide guidance on uh, laboratories on, on biological hazards in laboratories and healthcare sewage on Legionella and the uh, general occupational hygiene guidance. So maybe not as detailed as Justice database, but there is resource offered by the UK HSC. And um, another question we have from Mohammed who asked what will be control recommendations if biological hazard bacteria found in cooling tower? Um, and that is something that a water treatment company can help you with. So control of Legionella is primarily done through chemical dosing regime. Uh, if it's a cooling tower, then it's um, uh, adding chemicals to the water stream to kill any bacteria. So adding biocides and other chemical um, chemical elements. But if we talk about domestic systems, that it would be a program of regular flushing and making sure water is distributed at high enough temperature that any bacteria is killed. OK, um, two more minutes, so maybe we will be able to squeeze another question and. Um, there is a question from. Alessandra, and I think it's a, it's it's a great question to to close this meeting. Um, um, have you got any suggestion for a provider of more in-depth courses on biological hazards? I'm looking for a few days course, maximum a couple of weeks. Well, yes, it's a great question because you know we don't have the same uh, number of courses offer about biological hazards as we have for the other ones. So, yeah, uh, in, in Portuguese, we have some options here in, in Brazil. I offer the, this kind of, of course uh, here uh, in, in Portuguese for sure. Uh, and uh, it was one of the first uh, courses uh, offered in, in Brazil. We didn't have and a uh, course about about it uh, before mine and uh, well in English we have some things to check in uh, in, in Irish as well we have some uh, some books uh, especially about uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, other information uh, about uh, biological hazards uh, as well. Uh, so NIOSH provides uh, some uh, course about about that. Uh, I think you can find so we can find something out in eight I eight A agents uh, as well from United States of America because 
if I'm not wrong, uh, they have been offering some course uh, about about that. Uh, and uh, well, what else? Let me see. I don't know if you have something uh, in UK. Uh, yes, but uh, as I said, it's not common to to find here in Brazil. We have other uh, public institutions that offer this kind of course, but uh, it is uh, offered by by universities to nurses, doctors, you know, for a specific public, not for not not to occupational hygienists, professionals, you know, <laughs> so it's hard to to find it, but it's my suggestions. OK, and uh, as I said, uh, we have uh, different uh, different uh, websites and page to to consult and uh, through that you can find uh, uh, online course, uh, free online course, and uh, other other webinars and uh, information about uh, biological uh, hazard. But if I can give some recommendation, uh, my piece of the advice is uh, CDC website, NIOSH uh, website to find some information uh, about that. And uh, it's available for everybody. So yes, it's a great way to to get knowledge uh, about this issue. Thank you, Gustavo. And I think we always get this question at the end of 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 these webinars. You know, people are hungry for knowledge. You know, where I can get more. Yeah. And um, for sure. In 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 the UK. Um, I would recommend to check out Health and Safety Laboratory. Uh, I think they offer some courses on biological hazards, uh, but there is also a level two course on prevention and control of infection uh, that is free of charge the last time I checked, but it's only available to those who live in England. It is through the Future Learn, Future Learn uh, website, and um, I know that it was available at least a year ago when I checked it, so may maybe worth checking it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, uh, so we will move on to concluding this webinar. Uh, once again, thanks to everyone for attending this webinar today, and I hope you found the information provided here useful. Thanks to our speaker, Professor Gustavo, for all the effort put into preparing this presentation. Please reach out to him on LinkedIn and other social media accounts for further information. And of course, thank you, Lee, uh, for helping us organize this event. I wish you all the best, and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon at our upcoming events. Goodbye now. Goodbye, people. Thank you so much.